Well, if you would keep your Bibles open to the little letter to Philemon, as we continue understanding what this means in our day, and I've entitled this series of messages, uh, The Gospel According to Philemon, Knowing Your Place. We spent some time last week getting some background to the letter of Philemon, just so we could appreciate it even more. We learned last week about Roman slavery. We learned last week about how letters of that day were composed, how they were put together, how they were delivered. We learned last week a little bit about Onesimus, the runaway slave. We learned a little bit last week about Philemon, who is the slave owner. Paul's letter to the church that meets in Philemon's house is about reconciliation. It's not about slavery. But slavery is what grabs our attention, and rightly so. When the gospel is lived out in a church, what happens is it plants a seed that ends slavery and racism. Here's how it works. When Jesus Christ liberates me from my bondage to sin, when he changes me because I've turned my life over to him, I've repented of my sin, and I'm trusting him as my Savior and Lord. When that has happened, he reconciles me to God. I'm reconciled to God. He also places me into a church, a group of local believers who are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're reconciled to each other. So I'm reconciled to God and I'm reconciled to others. And that liberation from bondage to to sin and that, that reconciliation that happens in the church, what happens when it happens in here, it then spreads into the world. And it ends all sorts of injustices. So last week we we received a vivid picture of what slavery was in the Roman Empire. I want to give you a little idea of what human slavery is today, and so you'll see a slide on the screen about modern-day human slavery. I don't know if you knew those facts that are listed there. I won't read all of them. You can see them. The first one really grabs our attention, though. 21 million people today. In the United States... Sex trafficking has begun to surpass drug trafficking as the preferred revenue for gangs. Did you know that a slaveholder can make today five times more profit from sex trafficking than from any other form of forced work? And even while you'll see on the screen that when it comes to sex slaves, They make up only 25% of the overall slave population in the world, but they create two-thirds of the profit. There's a lot of money to be made. And you'll find around the world that governments are corrupt and they work because it's all about the money and not about human beings. And that's, that's the source is listed there, is from 2015, and you could look that up. But when you see those statistics on the screen there, You have to ask the question, what does Philemon say to those modern versions of slavery? One of the things it says is that justice that begins in the church does eventually end up or should end up as justice for all. And so what we're about to see this morning, as we look at God's holy and inspired word, we're going to see this morning how the Holy Spirit led and carried the Apostle Paul to lay the groundwork in a house church, led by a slave owner, when that slave owner has come to know Jesus, how it changes his life and eventually society. So look with me at at verse 1 of Philemon. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, and also to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. So we see here, this is to Philemon, and it's from Paul. Philemon is the slave owner whose life has been changed by Jesus Christ. And by the way, you shouldn't assume that Philemon has always been a follower of Jesus. He hasn't. 
He probably fell into the categories of a typical slave owner in the Roman Empire that we learned about last week. Onesimus is a runaway slave. And his life has been changed by Jesus. Paul led Onesimus, the runaway slave, to Jesus. And Onesimus has no control over how his slave owner is going to deal and react to his return. And Paul is like a mediator. He's a mediator who's putting pressure, as you've read, on a slave owner to change the way he thinks about and treats those over whom he has power and privilege as a Roman citizen. So legally and politically and economically, the Roman slave owner is in charge of this situation. And he can do whatever he wants to do. Because he has been, in that day, publicly humiliated by an escaped slave. He, in that day, took a huge hit to his own pocketbook. Again, part of the humiliation. And now this letter that we're looking at this morning is being read out loud in front of his entire household, which includes slaves. This isn't a private letter about his private life. In fact, it's a good thing for us to note here that following Jesus is never just merely about your private life. It's not just about your heart and God. It starts there, certainly, but your life and my life is on display for everyone to see. If Christ has really changed our lives, it will be evident. And so the question that Philemon is confronted with publicly is this. What difference has Jesus Christ made in your life? That's the question. That's before Philemon and everybody else in his household as it's being read. And it has to do with his attitudes. How has Jesus impacted your attitude? Would you write that down in your outline? How my attitudes impact others. We're going to take a look at how our attitudes impact other people. We'll do that by again looking at verse 1 where it starts, Paul says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. It's interesting that Paul says he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. This is one of the few times in Paul's letters where he doesn't refer to himself as an apostle. Now think about that. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Why does he do that? Why doesn't he pull out the apostle card? Why doesn't he do a little saber rattling with his authority as an apostle? Why does he call himself a prisoner of Christ Jesus? You know why? Because slaves are listening to him. And do you know what a slave understands? What it feels like to be a prisoner and have no control over your life. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Christ is my master. Christ is my slave owner. He owns me. You know what Paul could do is he could command Philemon. He could say, I'm the apostle Paul and this is what you're going to do. He doesn't do that. He says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Do you know how powerful that sounds in the ears of a slave? But think of how that sounds in the ear of the slave owner. The Christian slave owner hears Paul say, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. The slave owner, Philemon, is hearing this and he's saying probably to himself, you mean Paul, who has authority as an apostle, is not pulling out that authority card. Paul is choosing to identify with the powerless. Paul is choosing to identify with people who have been marginalized and pushed to the edges. Paul's attitude has a massive impact on other people because of something that he chose to do. And it's something you and I need to choose to do today. And I'd like you to write this down. It's our first attitude. It's that of empathy, not authority. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you're called to have a life of compassion, a life of empathy. Paul, a prisoner, a prisoner 
Paul says, Jesus is my king and Jesus owns me. And by the way, if you're following Jesus, he owns you too. I'm Jesus' slave. And by the way, if you follow Jesus, Jesus you're Jesus' slave also. So how should we think about each other? If I'm Jesus' slave and you're Jesus' slave, we're all slaves to Jesus Christ. How should we think about each other? Well, here's how we should think about each other. Look at what he says next in verse 1. He says, and Timothy, our brother. Look at verse 2. And Aphia, our sister. Brother. Sister. I mean, Timothy, it says, Timothy, our brother. Timothy, Timothy helped compose. He helped contribute to the content of this letter. That's what Paul says. This letter is from Paul, the prisoner of Christ, and Timothy, our brother. As a brother, Timothy had something to contribute to what was going on. In fact, you'll look at other Paul's letters. Paul says that Timothy also contributed to the composition of First and Second Thessalonians. Timothy also contributed to the composition of Second Corinthians. Timothy also contributed to the composition of the book of Colossians. Timothy also contributed as a brother to the composition of the book of, of Philippians. He's a brother. He has something to contribute. But guess who the sis- guess what the sister is? The sister, Aphia, you see it there. What is she? Why is she being noted? Now, we don't know exactly the relationship between Philemon, the slave owner, and Aphia and Archippus. We don't know exactly their relationship. There's a lot of speculation of how they're related. They may not be related, but we do know this. They, she, she, she exhibited an extended influence within the church. That's why she's being recognized. She contributes. So would you write this down? In terms of our attitudes, would you write this down? Not just empathy, but here's the second attitude we need to have is sibling equality. Sibling equality, not privilege. Not, you're not born into more influence in the church. It doesn't matter how much someone gives or what their last name was or how long they've been there. It doesn't matter at all. What matters is that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. It's sibling equality. There's no pecking order in the local church. In fact, anytime I would say, anytime you see a real strong emphasis in a local church about a pecking order or a hierarchy, you're, you can probably, gar- I probably guarantee you, you're probably in a church that puts a lot of emphasis on privilege and power. And they want to make sure you know your place. And it ain't at the top. But we don't find that in Paul. But we find Paul saying, is he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. What we find Paul saying is there's sibling equality, brothers and sisters. And then look what he says in verse 2. He says, to Philemon, our dear friend. Our dear friend. Really it means loved, dearly loved. Philemon, you are dearly loved. We know that Paul had some influence in leading Philemon to Jesus. That's why Paul says in verse 19 that you owe me your very self. In other words, Paul led him to Christ. And Paul has a relationship with him. There's there's something special. There's a special connection there. Paul's saying you're dearly loved, Philemon. You're dearly loved. I have a relationship with you, Philemon. Would you write this down? Our attitudes that impact others is that of relationships, not roles. Relationships, dearly loved. Look at the next thing it says in verse 2. Paul calls Philemon a, notice this, a fellow worker. Do you see that there, a fellow worker? By the way, that's a common phrase that Paul uses. If you read all of Paul's epistles, you'll see he uses this phrase frequently to refer to anybody who works alongside of Paul. Not under Paul. Oh, we think it's under Paul. You know why we think it's under Paul? Because we have a hierarchy and authority view of everything. Fellow worker, alongside of me, worker. That's what Paul says. You're a fellow worker. Alongside him in leadership. Let me show you a partial list of some of the people Paul mentions in his other letters. 
In, in Romans, he mentions Urbanus and Timothy. There's a lot more than this, but here's just a few of them. Apollos is a fellow worker in 1 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul refers to Titus as a fellow worker alongside of him. In the book of Philippians, he refers to Epaphroditus and also two women with difficult to pronounce names, Euodia and Syntyche. Now those names up there, when you're called a fellow worker, you might say, well, what does that mean, worked alongside of? And what you see when you look at all of Paul's writings about that phrase, fellow worker, he's talking about things like fellow workers do evangelism alongside of Paul. They reach the lost. Fellow workers teach alongside of Paul to build up the believer. Fellow workers help start churches. When you look at what they, they do and you read Paul's epistles, fellow workers pastor occasionally. Fellow workers also do discipling. And do you know what Paul does? He says, Philemon, you're a fellow worker. Philemon, see that list there? What I'm going to do, Philemon, I'm calling you a fellow worker. Philemon, I'm going to pull you right alongside of me. I'm going to put my arm around you, Philemon, in front of your whole house church, and I'm going to call you a fellow worker, and you're doing everything those people on the screen are doing right there. You're a fellow worker, and, and you know what? I want you to support me in letting your slave Onesimus join me as a fellow worker. That's what I want to see happen. Fellow workers pull people together. Would you write this down? This is another attitude within the church. How my attitude impacts others, we pull people together, not apart. When you have an organizational chart and you remind people what their place is, you're saying, you know what, you're over there. But when you're a fellow worker, we're all on the same team, pulling in the same direction. Look with me at verse 3. Verse 3 says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That word grace, Paul uses it all the time. It's a common word back in that day. Even in Roman literature, the word grace is used in Greek literature of the day. It's used all the time. It's the word charis. We get the word charismatic. It means gift. Literally, the word grace means gift. That's all it means. Very simple words. Paul says, grace, grace to you. Listen carefully. Grace is a gift that creates a relationship. And grace is a gift that obligates whoever receives it to do something in return. Anybody who receives grace is expected to extend grace. Anybody who receives forgiveness is expected to extend forgiveness. That's an obligation. And so Paul says to him, Philemon, grace and peace to you, grace to you. Philemon, you need to act out, you need to act out and live out the gift that you received from Jesus. You've been forgiven. You've been reconciled. And now grace requires you to forgive and to be reconciled. If someone's wronged you, forgive them. If you've received grace, you're obligated. Would you write this down as another attitude? I call it responsive grace. That's what grace is, responsive grace, as opposed to what? Cheap grace. Cheap grace, which costs nothing. Responsive grace is costly. Grace is purchased. And there's a financial injustice that Philemon senses because he's suffered. And Paul says, you know what, I'll pay that. I'll pay that. There'll be justice. I'll pay the financial cost. But grace received comes with expectation. Remember what Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is what? Required and expected. That's grace. And if grace doesn't change how I treat others, then you know what I have to do? I have to question whether or not 
I have ever received grace. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven as evidence that you have been forgiven. Look what he says next. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that word peace I'm looking at now. Peace, peace to you. Do you know what grace does? Grace creates peace. Grace creates the peace of reconciliation. Grace comes first. Grace doesn't create sides. Grace leads to peace. Grace doesn't create an enemy-making machine where we try to figure out who do I have to fight against today. Grace doesn't do that. Grace doesn't lead to that. Grace leads to peace. Would you write this down? Reconciliation. That's an attitude. That's an attitude. Reconciliation, not an us versus them. Peace. The peace of reconciliation. It's reconciliation between a slave and a slave owner, between the powerless and the powerful. And I'll tell you what, Philemon has a lot to lose because this grace is going to require Philemon to use his influence to serve and not be served. Isn't that what Jesus did? With all of his power, he laid it down. What are we called to do? If anybody wants to be great in the kingdom, what did Jesus say they have to do? Become the what? The servant, the slave of all. That's an attitude. I mean, look at the list of attitudes that you've written down there. Empathy, sibling equality, relationships, pulling together, responsive grace, reconciliation. I look at that list and I just have to ask myself, how am I measuring up when it comes to that? If I started measuring up, if I laid my attitudes next to that list, how am I doing today? What things is God nudging you about when you look at that list of attitudes? But it isn't just attitudes. In fact, Paul makes a real interesting transition here in verse 4. In verse 4, he shifts away from saying we. He says, he goes to the word I. First person, I. Singular, I. I, Paul. This is now Paul getting really personal in verse 4. I. Paul is going to make his private prayer life public in front of the whole church. Paul is going to share his devotional life. If you could go into Paul's quiet closet where he spends time with God, this is what would ooze out of Paul. Paul's going to put it right in, in ink. He's going to write it down. He wants everybody in Philemon's house to know what he's praying about. My attitudes impact you. Your attitudes impact me. Guess what else does? My prayers impact you. And by the way, your prayers impact me. So I want us to write down, what about prayers? Would you write this down? What my prayers do for others. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about your prayers. My, all of our prayers. When we're with God alone, what does your prayers actually do? This is a prayer of reconciliation that makes Maple Ridge Church the safest place on earth. Look at verse 4. Paul says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Sometimes people see the word always there and they think that Paul walked around 24 hours a day praying. That's not what he's saying here. When he used the word always, he was speaking to set hours of prayer. That was the habit of the Jewish followers of Jesus. They had set hours of prayer in that day. Paul's prayer life was most likely organized around the Shema, the hours of prayer where they would say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. That was what they would say three times a day. Morning, afternoon, and evening. Three times a day. So Paul's saying, you know what? Whenever I meet with God and have a quiet time, probably three times a day, I, I pray for you. That's what always means. I pray for you regularly. When I meet with God, you come out of my heart and mind before God. It's a sacred rhythm. Look at verse 4. He says, I thank God, I thank my God, and he uses an interesting word, as I remember you in my prayers. I don't know if you feel insufficient in your prayer life, but I do. And I read this, and I felt really encouraged this week. I realized I'm probably praying more than I realize. And I think you are too. 
When you remember somebody before the Lord, that's a prayer. Think of it that way. That's a prayer. You're remembering them before the Lord. And, and when you think about the, the idea of remembering somebody before the Lord, that has a lot of rich Old Testament symbolism and meaning to it. To remember somebody before the Lord. The Lord remembers things. Even Zechariah the prophet. His name means the Lord remembers. Remember, how about Hannah? Hannah and Samuel. And, and Hannah poured her heart out to God and God remembered her. Nehemiah wants God to remember the promises God made to his people. So when we remember people before the Lord, what this is telling us here is when you remember others before God, here's what you're doing. You're ushering them right into the presence of God. That's what's happening. In the invisible spiritual world before God, you are ushering people into his presence. And they sometimes don't even know it. They don't know it. Think of all you can do for people that they have no idea you're doing that. Would you write this down? It creates a space for God to work in their lives. What do my prayers do for others? It creates, it creates a space. My, the prayers that God uses in the name of Jesus and by his shed blood, when I come into the presence of God and I bring up a name before God, that name is there. What's happening in the spiritual world is you are opening up a sacred space before God, a space where forgiveness can come in, a space where there can be reconciling grace. God works through the prayers of his people. Like incense. And Paul says, I always thank my God. He, Paul does that all the time. I thank God. When I think of you, I'm thanking God for you. It's an honest gratitude. By the way, it's not because Philemon has everything together. There's things that Philemon needs to change, and Paul's going to talk about it. But there's so many things that Paul looks at Philemon's life and says, I see God in you. I see Jesus at work in you. And I thank God for what I see in your life. When I meet with God, I bring up the honest things I see that I'm encouraged about in your life. And I'm creating that sacred space. How about you? When your heart is heavy, when you're in a relationship and there's tension, and this is somebody you love, and you know something has to change, but you know that you can't change it and you can't fix it. But here's what you can do. You can get alone with God. You can get on your knees in a private place. You can pour your heart out to God. You can remember that person whom you love and you see some good qualities in them and you honestly bring them before God and you start that prayer with gratitude. You say, God, I thank you for this person. I thank you for what's going on in their life. And God, I know there's things that need to change, but only you can change it. I can't. Only you can fix it. I can't. That's what prayer does. It creates a space where you can bring someone before the Lord. Look at verse 5. Paul says, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Which I think is interesting because it looks like Paul hasn't really even met Philemon. He's led Philemon to Christ. I don't know how that happened. Maybe it was somebody that was doing work for Paul out in uh, the area. They led, so like by extension, Paul led them to Jesus. Paul led someone to Jesus who led Philemon to Jesus, perhaps. We don't know. But Paul's saying, you know what? I've heard, I've heard, I've heard about your faith and your love. Would you write this down? Affirm where we see Jesus in their life. There really is love. There really is faith in Philemon's life. And it's real. He, they're, they're siblings. They're part of the same family. Slave owner and slave are brothers. Look at verse 6. Paul says, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. In his prayer, he says, you know, I want you to know something, Philemon. I want you to know that we're on the same team. We have a partnership. See the word partnership? That, I, that your partnership. In other words, Philemon, we, we, ex we accomplish more together than we can apart. In fact, when we work together for the kingdom of God, when we build the kingdom of Jesus together here on earth, we come to know Jesus better. Our understanding 
deepens, not because we're sitting and just thinking about things. No, we're actually involved in life together. We have a partnership. We're on the same side. We're pulling in the same direction. Here's the application. Application for you and I. Are my understandings of God, are my perceptions of life changing as I'm following Jesus? Is there anything about me that is in any way deepening, going deeper with Jesus? You see, this is what your relationship with me does. This is what my relationship with you does. When we're in partnership together, our understanding, we go, oh, I didn't see that. It's like an aha moment. We're experiencing something together in partnership with the gospel. And sometimes, unfortunately, unfortunately, we come to church to do a Bible study, to learn more information, not a bad thing. But if all I'm doing is trying to learn more information to confirm my prejudices and my biases so I don't have to change, then I'm missing the boat. I have to say, is my, is my heart growing deeper? Am I discovering more of the good things we share in Jesus as we do life together? Is that happening? Look at verse 6 again. He says, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective. That's an interesting word, effective. In deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Would you write this down? Here's what your praying does. Your praying pushes them to do what's good. When you create that sacred space before, you, when you are alone with God and you bring up, you remember somebody before the Lord and you're thanking God for them, you're creating that sacred space, you're affirming what you see Jesus doing in their life, you're pushing them. They don't even realize it. They have no idea. You're pushing them to do good. You're pushing them toward change and you're not the one who's forcing it. God is doing the change. Paul is saying in front of this slave owner's entire family, can you imagine what this must have felt like to be the slave owner when other slaves are hearing Paul say this? Paul says, Philemon, I want you to know you're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's why I pray for you. Uh, Philemon, I'm praying that you're going to welcome back Onesimus. Onesimus is standing right there in the room. Other slaves are watching it. Uh, Philemon, I want you to know that um, you need to do good here. You need to be reconciled. You need to do good. Um, you need to let Onesimus join my team and travel with me. You need to do good here because he's your brother. He's not a slave. He's a man. He's not a boy. I want you to hear, slave owner, that Onesimus has a new place at the table, not on the edge of the room. So you and I, understand this, when you pray for somebody, your prayers are pushing silently people into deeper and deeper Christ-likeness. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, he continues his prayer, and he says, your love, your love, Philemon, has Given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. You know, I read that this week and I thought to myself, when people leave my presence, are they, are they encouraged? Are they a little, just a little bit more joyful because we spent some time together talking? When people leave my presence, are they refreshed? Or have I drained them? Have I drugged them down? Or maybe even as a pastor, if I apply it to my situation, I wonder, if people leave my presence, are they reminded that I'm the pastor? I'm the pastor. What is that? What is wrong with that? When they leave my presence, have I sent them a subtle message that I'm protecting my power and my position, reminding them who's in authority. That is not Christ's attitude. Why would I do that? 
So Paul looks at Philemon and says, Philemon, your love for people, I've heard about your love for people, Philemon, and it's helped a lot of people follow Jesus. Philemon, your love for Jesus is helping me to follow Jesus. You love people. People are refreshed by you, Philemon. And he's saying that in front of all the slaves in the house. And it's not flattery. And then he looks, then he looks at Philemon and he says, I want you to refresh my heart too. And do you know where my heart is, Philemon? It's Onesimus. How you treat Onesimus right now in front of your entire household church is how you treated my heart. So here's my heart, and it's Onesimus. You know what, brothers and sisters? God uses your prayers to open up people's eyes like Philemon's eyes were just opened here. God uses your prayers to open up Philemon's eyes so he can, say that he can see the impact what he does has on others. Would you write that down in your outline? It reveals the impact they have on those around them. It reveals the impact. So you and I, our attitudes impact one another. You and I, our prayers make a difference, it impacts, and, and this, is where, this is where the application has to start, is right here. Justice begins in the church, and reconciliation begins in the church, and only then can we expect to go to that first slide about human slavery today and say, what difference can we make in the world? It has to happen here first. We are on display. All men will know that you're my disciples, Jesus says, by the authority you have over one another. No! Jesus says, all men will know you're my disciples when they know their place and the pecking order in the church. No! Jesus says, all men will know that you're my disciples by the what? The love you have for one another. It starts here. It starts with us. And here's what I see. I see it at Maple Ridge Church. I see God at work in you. I feel your prayers for me. I'm becoming more like Jesus because of you. And I hope you can say, you're becoming more like Jesus because of me. We're in a partnership of building the kingdom of God together on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this little letter. I thank you. It's a letter about reconciliation, about attitudes, and about prayers. And I pray that all people would know that we are your followers by the love we have for one another, a love that lays down its life for one another, a love that sets aside rights and privileges, a love that looks out for the powerless and the marginalized, a love that has a sibling equality about it. Holy Spirit, keep doing that work among us at Maple Ridge Church. Let us be your witnesses in this community. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.